Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. ProXPN is the leading VPN service offering free accounts, excellent premium features, and an outstanding commitment to privacy and security online. Use the discount code WEEKLY and save 50% off for life. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email them at contact at netsparker.com. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fabulous interview with none other than Ed Scotus, who is no stranger to the Security Weekly Show. Ed, welcome back to the Security Weekly Show extravaganza. Yay! Hey, Paul, how's it going? It's going fantastic. Uh, it's always nice to, to sit and chat with you, Ed. Um, we could sit, we were just talking before, we we're like, we should probably start the interview because <laughs> we were just chatting. We haven't chatted in a while, so we need to fix that. We need to chat more often. Um, it's, it's great to see you, Paul. And yeah, you look to you. beautiful. You're looking beautiful. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a little cold here in Rhode Island today. It's kind of cold and damp, so I had to break out my hat. As you know, with no hair, you got to keep your head warm. So You do. It's very important. You can get is. a t-shirt made of that. Keep your head warm. That's it. Yep. So, Ed, you had a couple of topics you wanted to talk about uh, today. W one is IoT, which is the first one, yeah. um, which I'm excited about. It, I find it interesting now that we call it IoT and a lot more people are doing research and it's making mainstream media. It, but these are still problems we've had for a long time, and we used to call sure. it embedded device security. Now it's IoT, uh, and you just recently gave a talk at DerbyCon um, on the topic of IoT. So, you know, what are some of your thoughts and what you're thinking about IoT today? Sure. So, my wife for Christmas uh, last year bought me three Philips Hue bulbs, mm -hmm. and she also bought me a. Um, it's called a Mesmer tube, and a Mesmer tube is kind of like a Jacob's ladder, mm -hmm. uh, but a little different. What you have is you have a dome of glass. It's about like that big, and uh, the dome of glass is painted with a phosphorescent paint on the outside, and then there's another dome of glass that goes around it. You put three thousand volts of AC across this thing. And it makes these beautiful, like, electrical patterns in there. So awesome. she bought me these, these things for Christmas. And starting on January 1st, I started to put them and infuse this technology into my steampunk office. Mm -hmm. you, you remember, it's all steampunk here and such. And we, we got to get you here in the office sometime. I, know, I do. I want to visit your office. Yeah. So, so we did that. Uh, and I started working on it in January. And then hooking it up to the cloud. And then buying more and more Philips bulbs. And, and then I got now, a raspberry. I have to ask you, Ed. Did you buy the Philips Hue, the Bloom? I did not get a Bloom. No. I now, I want to just stop you there and recommend the Bloom before I forget. Because uh, I bought a Bloom, and I love it. It's mm. in my uh, dining room, and yeah. it shines in the corner. And I change the colors of co according to the season. So in the summer, it's a, it's a nice, you know, like greenish kind of blue. When Halloween starts to come along, I'm going to change it very soon to orange. Christmas cool. time, it's red. Nice. And it just, you know, automatically goes on when it's, when it's dark and goes off when it's light. And yep. Yep. I find that I don't have to put any other lights on, like at night, if you need to walk around, it kind of acts like a night light. But it's a nice mood light. I think they're fabulous. They're a little expensive, but I, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. My wife's like... Really, that's your concern? Like, uh, I was like, you know, can we change the, is the bloom working? I'm like, because yes. I need to change the color soon. She's like, this is what you think about as like your concern. I'm like, this is very important. It has to be the right color for the right season. Dude, so I have a total problem. I, um, I have the light strips. I love the light strips. They're great mm. under furniture. And then I have a lot of the bulbs. And if you add up the number of light strips and bulbs that I have, I have a confession. I have a problem, Paul, uh, an addiction. I have 25 of them now. That's awesome. And I mean, if, if you come to my office on a Friday or Saturday night, it is it is club counter hack. Yeah, it's like a, a DJ club. Skodo, <laughs> DJ Skodo, rocking it. And, and now I've integrated it into my shades. I've got a fan that I can control. And it, yeah, because it looks kind of bright in your office, Ed. I was wondering if you could do something about that. I think I could fix that. <laughs> I do. I do. Here we go. This is so cool. Blinds down. The live demo. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, yeah. I've been looking at that. I See, I, I'm all into the home automation. And here you and I have given talks at several conferences about IoT security. And we're both like, no, like I love automating stuff around my house. Oh, yeah. And watch this. Um, 
I could do, I mean, I could turn the Mesmer tube on. And let's see if I can get the Mesmer okay, tube. Okay, the Mesmer tube is on. There's the Mesmer oh, tube. I don't think nice. you can see it, but nice. it's, yeah, it, it, the camera doesn't do it justice, but it's pretty cool stuff. Now, did the, the Mesmer tube come with some kind of connectivity, or did you have to build something? Oh, that's all done via Wemo. Okay, so, okay. Um, I'm, I'm using Wemo to control my outlets, and I have elaborate scenes set up. Mm. So I, I speak things into Siri, mm -hmm. and then Siri makes calls back into a Raspberry Pi that I've got. And okay. I'm running a, a, a program on there. It's, it's called HomeBridge. Mm -hmm. And the idea of HomeBridge is it opens up Siri so you can control anything. I, I can say something to Siri, and it will execute a command mm -hmm. on the Pi, which means I can do anything. The command I could execute could make the Pi do something yeah, itself, yeah. or I could execute open SSH. So it will SSH to anywhere in the world and do something else there. Now, so the, now have, the home bridge is a, is a smart things for play. I use smart things at, at my house, but home bridge essentially is an open source version of the home automation controller. It is, and it's all written in Node. Mm -hmm. um, it's done by this guy named Nick Farina. It is spectacular. Um, and I've created all these different things. I could say activate red alert, and then my office starts flashing red and white with this old Star Trek sound. <laughs> like that. That's um, awesome. I've got randomized lights, and the lights just turn random colors. I've got I can make the lights this color, that color. I, it's, it's a whole well, bunch. Now, Ed, of stuff. we're talking about all this cool stuff, and it, yeah. in the TV show, Mr. Robot, it, it was one of the first, I think, commercial, uh, one of a better example of a mainstream show displaying yeah. like what can go wrong if your whole home is connected. I don't want to ruin the show, but basically, right. the hackers break into a, a house and wreak havoc. Yes, and let me let me tell you a little bit about where where things I think are heading. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I, I essentially turn my home office here um, into an IoT test bed with a lots of different technologies. Yes, I'm controlling things via Siri mm -hmm. and this home bridge thing, but I'm doing a lot of development in Node, Python, and a lot of Bash. Frankly, right. it's kind of sticking all this stuff together. And that's Node.js is that the, the yeah, yeah. Okay. Node.js. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's Node.js, and it's really cool stuff. Holiday Hack Challenge 2015 mm -hmm. was largely built in, in Node. Node. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And and now my office is, and the new networks experiences, and a it, lot. And of it's things. interesting. It has commercial applications. Our interface for offensive countermeasures is written in Node.js. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, Google's doing a lot of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these other high tech companies are. It's really cool. But so that's that's one thing that I've taken away from this is like Node is big, it's solid, it's neat. Um, oh, by the way, if you if you start learning how Node actually works, it makes no sense. If you know anything about computer science, Node is like a disaster. But really? darn, it works. It's single threaded, single processor. It all runs inside a web server, and it's server side interpreted JavaScript. If anything crashes, everything crashes. Uh, go, go. <laughs> interesting. Like, when Josh Wright first proposed to me that, that he wanted to do a uh, holiday hack challenge in, in Node last mm -hmm. year, dude, you're nuts. No way. We're not, you, anyway, we used it. We had 100% uptime. 100% uptime. Um, so that's one thing is Node is here. It's real. Node.js, amazing stuff. So that's one conclusion I've come to. Next conclusion. Um, I tried to use Mac OS X's built-in voice recognition. This was before Siri came mm -hmm. to the Mac. I tried to use its built-in voice recognition to implement my office, and it was horrible. Instead, I've essentially outsourced my voice recognition to Apple and Siri. Now, Josh Wright has done a lot of stuff with Amazon and Echo. Yep. I have some other friends that are, that are working with Google and their cloud speech API. There's other people working with Microsoft Cortana. And here's the conclusion I've come to. Normal software developers like you, like me, we're going to increasingly integrate AI and natural language processing into our stuff by making calls out into the cloud. I've never been a big supporter of the cloud until I started doing this stuff in my office. But the idea is very big, very rich companies have hired some of the best AI people in the world mm -hmm. so that they can integrate AI into their products and make APIs available to us, the regular developers. And the way it's going to work is this. This is what I'm doing in my office. You will gather some sort of unstructured data. I'm gathering voice. You will then hand it up to very rich company that has all these AI people working for it, that spent a billion dollars on their Siri or Cortana or whatever it is, say, here's, here's the unprocessed, mm. unstructured data, process it for me, and I will publish to you a set of APIs that you call based on your analysis of that. And I'm telling you, I think that's the future of software development. Big, rich companies with their AI, us little normal people send stuff into them, and then we get API calls back. Um, 
It's the way my office works, and it's tremendous because I can't build my own Siri. My wife even yeah. said to me, why don't you just build your own Siri? It's like Apple spent a billion dollars on that. I can't. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's my second conclusion, conclusion from this office work. Um, third conclusion, security is, is horrifying in this whole thing. Yeah. Um, we most controlled via unauthenticated HTTP. Um, Telnet is available on some of these devices by default. You got to shut it off. Um, I have one here in the office, Ed, that's Telnet yeah. with no authentication. And it gives you full, complete control. You can reset the device. You can change things, delete things, the whole thing. So, so, so I have some stuff that are like that as well. But here's a, here, trying to talk myself into the fact that this is okay. Suppose you have Telnet with no authentication or Telnet with a well-known username and password that you cannot mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Is that really any different than unauthenticated HTTP to control no. this stuff? No, yeah. Or unauthenticated HTTPS. It's, it's or an unauthenticated API. Yeah, it's just there's no authentication in, God forbid, authorization to, to these devices built in. And I think you and I have had this conversation before. Someone needs to come up with a standard for that for all of these devices. That would be fabulous. That would be great. And in the meantime, you need to do a, a specialized, dedicated wireless LAN with a crazy hard WPA2 key. That's how I, I was going to, that's exactly how I was thinking of solving the problem is yeah. Ethernet cable from a Raspberry Pi directly into <laughs> those devices, <laughs> right? There you go. Problem yeah. solved. <laughs> problem solved. Uh, so, so if you look at my office, it's got a lot of Wi Fi, it's got Zigbee, it's got Bluetooth. So it's all these wireless technologies. And I've been sniffing the mm -hmm. heck out. Um, because, I mean, that's how you learn this stuff is to sniff right. it. So I've got this test bed where I can learn. There's another conclusion I've come to that's actually. I think pretty big, especially for, for the kind of people that, that listen to Paul Security Weekly, people like me, right? Um, and that is, if you look over the last five years or so, or even 10 years, um, you know, we've been hacking embedded devices. Now they're called Internet of Things, and we're hacking the devices. And there's been a lot of very good work, a lot of great research on hacking the devices. You alluded to it when you started this whole segment. But you know where cool stuff is happening? Is it's where these devices touch the cloud. Mm -hmm. That those APIs, those protocols that they're using to communicate are not vetted, and they're ripe for hacking. There's so much cool stuff. Look, being able to hack into a light bulb and turn it on or off, that's kind of neat. Right. Good stuff, right? But being able to, to hack into cloud control of this stuff and being able to control thousands or millions of devices, now we're talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where I've been spending a lot of my time is looking at the cloud integration of Internet of Things devices and to see how they're controlled en masse. It is fascinating. There's vulnerabilities all over the place. Mm -hmm. Really cool. And I would encourage your folks to kind of build their own test beds. You don't need to go crazy elaborate like I did here, but building a test bed of IoT devices, connecting them to the cloud, at least in your test bed, so you can see what's really going on there. Mm -hmm. There's a swamp of vulnerabilities, and I think we, the hackers, need to help drain that swamp. That's what we do, right? Right. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. So that's so that's another conclusion I've come to. The next conclusion I've come to is um, voice control is awesome. You know, mm. some people don't like voice control. My wife, she's like, why do you want to do all that stuff? It's crazy. Uh, I don't have a GUI to control the stuff in my office. Actually, I do have a GUI that I can use in case voice stuff breaks down. Um, I also do at the command line. I can control mm -hmm. the command line, but I don't use them. I insist on voice control for everything. My staff, I have, I have four full-time people at work out of my office. Um, the, the, the irony is I travel more than they do, so they're in my home office, and, and I'm not. But putting that aside, it's, yeah, their office in my home. Um, but they control it all via voice, and that's really, really cool because it's a steampunk vibe, right? And if you go back to 1880, I'm not a, I'm not a historian, but I don't think they had a lot of GUI control or command line control of their devices in those days. Mm -hmm. But you could say to your horse to do something, and your horse might do that, right? So voice control it really fits with my steampunk theme. And that's kind of cool too. So, so some people are really into voice stuff. Some people aren't into voice stuff. Um, I think in the future, more and more of us are going to just get used to the idea of controlling things with our voice. Yeah. And I, I think that technology is going to get better. Yeah. Um, it does that. So the voice doesn't provide any authentication like no. the, the popular movie. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, so, you know, you have to be locally in my office. And there, there is an option within Apple's home kit that I could say you have, look at product placement. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, they should write us a check. <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite the truth is the checks are being written the opposite direction. But, yes. Um, anyway, uh, you have to be in my office, but there is an option within home 
uh, kit with Apple that you could allow for remote control access. And I love the remote control access. So I could be anywhere in the world. I can play music in my office. I can change the color of the lights to purple. My staff looks around like, oh, Ed's at it again. Um, you know, it's, it's just fun to do. My office, I try to make it feel like you're, it, it, it's smart and it knows you. I, I want it to be like Jarvis from, uh, from Iron Man, you know, you just talk yes. to it. Does yes. for it. So you could say, uh, you could say sports info and it'll read verbally the top five headlines at ESPN. And now um, for the speakers, are you using Sonos or some other kind of system? I'm using a 1932 Atwater Kent model 80 radio. So it's wow. from 1932 and it sounds beautiful. All the tubes and everything. Um, so that's the, that's the official speaker and voice of my office. And it really sounds good. It's mono because I mean, look, it was 1932. Mm. But, you know, the office is big enough that mono actually makes sense. And uh, it speaks. When, when you say good morning to my office, um, it, uh, it opens the shades. It turns on the lights. It starts playing music from the 1940s. And then it plays a little BBC-style tone. It goes boo 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 like that. Says the day, the date, and announces the weather for the day. Because I want it to feel like it's aware oh, of, yeah. of what's going on in the outside world and what's going on inside of it. I'm sort of working on this project on the side where it senses the Mac addresses from probes from the various devices in the office so it'll know whose phone is in the office. And then it could say, good morning, Ed, because mm -hmm. it, it's me. Uh, it's a little creepy. So I haven't, I haven't really rolled that out yet, but I'm, I'm looking at it. It's, it wouldn't be that hard to implement. Um, another thing my office does at the top of every hour, it plays uh, Westminster, Westminster chimes and then goes bong, bong. And the lights pulse purple as it bongs because <laughs> I, want it, I want it to feel like it's pulsating and it's alive. Anyway, so it's all this fun stuff. Um, and I've learned so much doing it. Mm -hmm. It's the most fun thing that I do. Ha I, so that, how much programming was involved to make all that work? Um, if you look a little bit of Node, mm -hmm. a few hundred lines. Um, there's probably, if you add the Python and Bash all together, maybe five or 6,000 lines of code. Okay. Maybe a little bit more. It's, it's got to be under 10. I haven't really counted. Um, but I get all these new ideas and I keep implementing. A lot of Friday nights or Saturday nights, um, I'll be coding stuff for the office. Let me tell you, I had not done an all-night coding episode in 20 years until July 5th. July 5th this year, I, I stayed up all night coding and I loved it. My wife saw me at 4.30 in the morning and she's like, are you okay? <laughs> I'm like, yes, this is awesome. Watch this. And the office starts dancing. I find myself taking on projects lately too. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, and I have three kids at home. I have an infant. And so it, my, I have to spend time coding. And then that usually cuts into other things that have gotten cut short, like showering. And I'm like, wow, like I own uh, my business and stuff. I'm like, but I'm like the smelly programmer right now. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it crazy? It it's good. crazy. I, I love doing that stuff. It's just so much fun. And I, I'd encourage people to start, you know, hacking the Internet of Things and, and thinking not only about the devices, but where the devices reach to the outside world and get into the cloud. That's where you're going to find some really cool stuff. I know it. And, of course, responsible disclosure, right? We want to responsibly disclose our findings. And now, so uh, the security concerns with what you've implemented in your office, uh, mm -hmm. if people are going to take that on, like what advice do you have to secure these devices? The, the biggest thing is um, implementing a special uh, wireless LAN just for it or maybe even for individual slices of technology within it. It's yeah. segmentation ultimately mm -hmm. is what it comes down to. But it's segmenting your wireless through a custom dedicated um, access point with a very difficult to crack shared WPA2 key. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where we are with the technology. I mean, there's other stuff you can do. Most of the cloud-based providers let you turn off remote access, but remote access is awesome. Um, but you could turn that off, so mm -hmm. somebody has to be at least on the same wireless LAN to control all this stuff. I got you. Um, there's, you know, if, if the device lets you set a password, uh, set the password, set it to something good, realize that the devices, for the most part, are storing the password in clear text on the device. Mm -hmm. So if the device gets hacked and you're using a shared password, the bad guy's got everything for, mm -hmm. for all the devices. So, I mean, is that a good password for it? I mean, that, that just makes sense. It's the right thing to do. But realize it's probably going in clear text, at least in the file system of the device and perhaps across the network. But that's why you're going to sniff it to find that out. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so you also wanted to talk about uh, what was the next thing after IoT? I think Holiday Hack Challenge. Yes. Yeah. And so you're working on a, well, pretty much when you complete the last one, you start working. We, that's the right. Next one. Yeah. In fact, usually, so, so for those that aren't aware of this thing, we put together 
a, a holiday hack challenge every year. And I've done like, I don't know, 13 or 14. And I work with my team on me. So we've got amazing people like Josh Wright, Tim Medine, Jeff McJunkin, Tom Hessman, Phil Smith. I mean, this whole amazing team of people that spend thousands of hours working on Holiday Hack Challenge every year. Last year's, we had an integrated video game. It's called Gnome in Your Home. I remember I was on your show yes. kind of telling people about it. Gnome in Your Home was last year's, the 2015 one. We had an integrated video game where you'd have to go and collect things, like collect packet captures. You'd collect hints. We would give you the firmware of these gnomes, and you, you have to find the super gnome controllers that are on the Internet. So it was an Internet of Things thing. There's like 2 million gnomes controlled by five super gnomes, and you'd have to hack into the super gnomes. And <clears throat> there was this elaborate plot to steal Christmas. In fact, as I was driving home from being on your show last year, that's where I got the final idea of who the supervillain was that tried to steal Christmas last year. Um, anyway, so that's what we did. I, I really want to emphasize to people, we keep all of the old holiday hack challenges up and running all the time. So if, if you've never done the 2015 one, you could do it right now. You, you could do it a year from now. We keep all of them up. I spend over $1,000 a year in hosting to host all of these old holiday hack challenges with the hope that people will still go through them. You don't have to wait for Christmas. You, you can go through them now. And we have all answers published from all the old ones. So before we talk about 2016, Excuse me. Bless you. Bless Thank you. you. Before we talk about 2016, people can do the 2015 one like right now and still have fun with it. Um, but the 2016 one, we're yeah, I'm curious. At, I want some hints. I want some some. I want the juicy stuff. It's gonna be cool. It's gonna be cool. We we let me tell you, we're gonna do a video game again. So there's gonna be this video game where you kind of run around inside the video game and you'll have to collect artifacts. I'm not gonna tell you the theme of the thing, but you'll collect various artifacts inside the video game, and we're gonna add some new features into the video game. One of them is going to be teleportation. If anybody played last year, they'd remember they have to run across this village. And if you had to go to the other side of the village, it might take you a long time of running across. Yeah. Now, as you're running across, you might run into me or Tim Medine or Josh Wright or a whole bunch of players because you talk to other players in the game. But it took a while to run across the village. We're going to have teleportation. Another thing we're going to do is um, this is this is pretty cool. Our non-playing characters who give out hints will move. It, last year, in 2015, you'd have to bump into a non-playing yeah. character, and then he'd give you a hint. And I would go in... So my non-playing character was called Ed Scotus. Each, each person on my team had an NPC in the game, and mine was called Ed Scotus. But I would log in as me, actually, and I would be called Real Ed Scotus. And I would kind of run around, right? And just... I'd talk to people and see them inside the game. People would think that I was a non-playing character, and if they bumped into me, they'd get me a hint, or they'd get a hint. So I would log into the game as Real Ed Scotus, and I'd start running around... People would chase me, <laughs> trying to bump into me, so they hit. but it wasn't, it wasn't the non-player me, it was the real me. Anyway, it was weird. So that gave me the idea of wouldn't it be cool to have non-player characters where you have to chase them and maybe even work with other players to corner the non-player character and bump into them so you get their hint. So that's another thing we're working on. We're also working on this big internet scavenger hunt thing. It's going to be very different from a technology perspective of last year. Last year, we focused a lot on Internet of Things and Node.js. Mm -hmm. All the supernomes were written in Node.js. This year, it's going to be a whole different set of technologies with really cool stuff. I'd love to share this with you, Paul. I'm so excited about it. I was at DerbyCon last week, and so many people came up to me and said, Ed, we didn't know how to hack Node.js until we saw it in Holiday Hack Challenge 2015. But since we did that, we're getting all these pen test jobs that involves that technology. Mm. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. I mean, so, so they first got exposed to hacking that technology in Holiday Hack Challenge, and now they're doing that in their work, these professional pen testers. I was like, oh, that makes me so That's happy. That's awesome. Like six or seven people at DerbyCon said that to me. And so now the new one, you're going to change the, the web technology? We are. You're going to see some Node because Node is pretty yeah. much everything that we do. Uh, here at Counterhack nowadays, but we're going to put some other stuff, really cool stuff in there. And I, it, the whole reason we do this is to help people learn. We want you to learn practical, valuable skills, not just pen testing skills, but also digital forensic skills, mm -hmm. um, uh, cyber defense skills. We try to infuse all of these skills into this. Um, and I can give you one more little hint. Do you want it? Yes, yes. I'm on the edge of my seat. There you go. So at DerbyCon... We handed out to people a little card about that big, okay? It was the size of a business card. And on the business card, it was very, very simple. It simply said, S-Clause, Worldwide 
uh, toy distribution and logistics. And uh, it had a little candy cane on there. And we handed out uh, three or 400 of those to people just so they had sort of a physical memento Mm -hmm. of what the Holiday Hack Challenge was going to be about. But I'd hand this thing to people and I'd say, what is that? And they'd look at it and say, it's a business card. And I'd say, well, whose business card? And they say, Santa. And I would say, exactly. Anyway, that's it. And that was it. That was it. I love it. Holiday Hack Challenge. Get ready. It's coming. We're going to launch December 9th. And uh, my whole team's going to be working on it. Uh, we're super excited. Hey, I hope what's people... the website for that, Ed? Uh, HolidayHackChallenge.com. Okay. If they go there now, they'll see the 2015 one, and it's up, and you can play it. So you can start getting practice, like, right now, just, mm-hmm. you know, an hour or two a week, just having fun. Um, we're going to have a soundtrack for the 2016 one, just like we had for 2015, but a whole new soundtrack. The graphics are going to look more intricate and better. There's going to be more rich gameplay inside the video game. One of the coolest things last year, uh, uh, I'm telling you, Paul, was when people would have their children in their jammies sitting in front of the Christmas tree playing Holiday Hack Challenge video game <laughs> to get the packet capture assets or to find the hint that they then give to mom or dad who would then use that. And then the kids and the, the, the parents would work together solving Holiday Hack Challenge. People would tweet these pictures of their kids in their jammies doing Holiday Hack Challenge. I almost cried. That's great. Just, oh, it's so cool. So, yeah, December 9th, 2016, it's coming. If it, awesome. if, if it kills me yeah. <laughs> and the rest of the guys, we're going to make it special. So. And then uh, also coming up uh, this year is the Hackfest, correct? Yes, yes, the Sands uh, Pentest Hackfest, we call it. Uh, that's huge. We put everything we've got into this one event. I, it's ideally suited to people who, who watch uh, Paul Security Weekly. Uh, it runs November 2nd through 9th, um, and we got tons of stuff in it. So it's a two-day summit where we have some of the best speakers in the industry. Um, Tom Liston is going to present there, Josh Wright, Tim Medine, um, uh, James Line is going to be keynoting it. Uh, just great, great stuff. And the guys have, for this two-day thing, they're kind of into one-upmanship. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to do a talk that is more useful more entertaining and more visually stunning than anybody else's talk. And Josh Wright just sent a request last week asking if he can have a fog machine on stage during his talk. He CC'd Tim Medin and James Line and, <laughs> and, and, and Tom Liston because he wants a fog machine. Tom Liston said that the first two rows, when he gives his talk, are going to be a splash zone. He's going to hand out ponchos. Look, we, we, we remove all the stops of this. It's going to be ev- everything, right? We're going to do three nights of Net Wars. Normally, in a Sands event, we do two nights. So mm-hmm. you get three nights of Net Wars. We're going to do um, Coinapalooza, where you get a chance to earn the Sands Pentest Challenge coins for Sands classes you've already taken. So if you took, like, 504 a few years ago but never got the coin, or even if you did get the coin, if you make it into Net Wars level two, we'll give you the 504 coin. If you make it into level three and you've taken the class, we'll give you your 560 coin or your 573 coin or your 542 coin or 575 coin. Make it into level four, you get your 600 level coin, like 617 or 642. Mm-hmm. So are there, are there courses yeah. that will run for this or like, like how's it? Absolutely. So the first two days are these, these talks. Okay. So it's, a, it's a summit, we call it. And then the six days after that, that's where we're going to have courses. And we've got great courses like 504, which is being taught by Chris Pizer. That guy is awesome. Oh, man, he's so good. We've got uh, 542, which being, is being taught um, by Moses Hernandez. Mm-hmm. He is like an up-and-coming rock star. So impressive, this dude. A lot of other courses being taught by other guys. Uh, 642, Adrian Debupre, you know, he's, he's now taken on some of the co-author of that course. I'll be teaching 560. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, for those that don't know, 504, Pizer's class, it's going to be on uh, incident handling and hacker attacks. 542 is web app pen testing. Uh, 642 is advanced web app pen testing. 560 is network pen testing. It's going to be so much fun. But there's more. We're also going to be doing Cyber City Night, mm-hmm. where you're going to have to protect the city. Cyber City is a, a physical city. It's six feet by eight feet in size. But you're going to have to protect it when it comes under terrorist attack. So you'll be logged into the city infrastructure and stopping bad guys from causing mayhem. So we got Net Wars. Coinapalooza, Cyber City. My wife bakes cookies for this. Nice. So here she bakes cookies, and she's going to bring down a couple hundred cookies for us to eat. They're called Joe Mama's Top Secret Cookies. My <laughs> wife is Joe. Um, and I tell you, intelligence agencies around the world are trying to get the recipe for these cookies. They send, <laughs> they send people to tour my office and they <clears throat> to get the cookie recipe, That's really and they funny. haven't gotten it yet. Uh, and there's one more thing. 
we, in the last two years of Hackfest, have done a super secret field trip um, where buses show up at 5 p.m. on night two of the summit. This year it'll be November 3rd. At 5 p.m. buses will arrive. We'll all hop on the buses and drive to a super secret facility where we're going to blow your mind. Last year, the super secret facility was the National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian Museum. Oh, Wait, the so whole this is, where is this conference taking place, in Virginia or D.C.? Or? Yeah, it'll be in the D.C. area. Okay. So it's going to be in D.C., Crystal City. Um, and we, I mean, we, what we do, what we did last year, is we created a, a very fun um, and very social scavenger hunt, capture the flag, where you could use your phone to go through the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum working in a team of three to five people. So you get to work with other people, walk through the museum, and solve various challenges, hacking challenges, ciphers, that kind of stuff. Very, very fun. Um, the year before, we went to the National Cryptologic Museum, the one up by Fort Meade. You know, mm -hmm. it's the NSA's museum. So far, we're the only organization other than the NSA to ever hold an event there. Mm. And man, was that hard to do, but we did it. Mm. And, and, you know, at both the National Cryptologic Museum and at the Air and Space Museum, we had, um, we had beer, we had wine, we had soda, water. We also had an ice cream uh, bar, so you put together, you know, ice cream sundae, nice. and my wife's cookies. So this year, we're going to go to another super secret place. The team is hard at work on a capture the flag there. I, I please, I beg of, of, of your viewers, just go and check out Hackfest. You can go to www.sands.org slash hackfest there we're doing this to give back to the community just and and i hope they'll be able to come i mean we we want to share with people the amazingness uh that that is you know the hacking world and that's what we're trying to pull all this together at this hackfest so it'll be again november 2nd through 9th in the washington dc area i hope we'll see you there paul can you come uh i, I might be able to make that work november 3rd I'm just saying, super secret. Yeah, I want to go on the super secret field trip. <laughs> you have uh, you have my personal invite. If you well, can be there and you want to be there, Larry's going to be there. Just saying. And I don't think Larry loves me more than you do, yeah. but we have a test. We have a test now. <laughs> just saying. No pressure. Larry no pressure. might wear his kilt as well, which is bonus. Are you saying I should uninvite Larry? No, I'm saying that's a bonus. <laughs> You're <laughs> You're right. I, anyway, I'm, uh, in all sincerity, I do hope you, you join us. I, I, I'd love to have you be my special guest at this special Hackfest field trip. That's awesome. I mean, th that's a lot going on for a conference, uh, which always at. So now the does the is the networks like extra like what or is it included or like it's included. Everything's included. There's nothing extra. So you got the two days. Mm -hmm. Right. And you could just come to the two days. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I hope people I mean, if you can only make it to the two days, come to that. And then there's the six day training after that. If you can just come to the six day training. Hey, that's fine, too. If you can come to the whole enchilada, even better. But everything's open to everybody, you know, in the evening sessions and such. So if you're just coming to the six day part, mm -hmm. you can come to the super special field trip. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's there, gotcha. right? It's got to come the night before your class starts. So there's no extra charge for Cyber City or, or Net Wars? Nope. nope. It's wow. all built that's in. A, but that's a great value. Yeah. I mean, we, we hope so. Um, you can buy it, though, in the two-piece yep. or the six-piece separately, or there's like a whole package thing. I gotcha. Through. Okay. So that's, that's how you buy it, and then you get access to, to everything, all the night events as well. That's right. Yep. And, and there's so much fun night events. We want it to be a time of fun and networking. And, you know, some people, they get a little intimidated. You know, Net Wars, can I play Net Wars? I don't know if I'm good enough to play Net Wars. Um, you play under a pseudonym um, and there's beer. So and yeah, at the very least, come, you know, and, and learn have, regardless of your skill level. Drink yeah. some beer and, and go play and have fun. And have fun. And nobody's going to look down on you if you only get 18 points because no one will know it's you. Right, you can sit right. there and say, hey, I'm in the middle somewhere. Or it, it, it's all good. Just have fun. And you can earn those coins. I mean, making it to level two is not that hard. Mm -hmm. And if you've taken 504, which I know a lot of your viewers have taken 504, they've got the skills to go from right, level, right, to level right. two. Um, it'll be a good time. So, so anyway, thanks for, for letting me share a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, no, that sounds like a lot of fun. I didn't realize everything that was going on at that, at that conference now. I think um, we used to call it the, the Pentest Summit we many, did. many years ago. We, we did. went to a couple of those, there. and those were a lot of fun. You broadcast a show from, from we one did. of We did. Yeah, we broadcast a show. Yeah, yeah. So That's great. I'm glad to see the, it has uh, evolved into this extravaganza, which is great. It's, it's so much fun. And thanks for your support during those uh, early times we were doing the Pentest Summit. Um, but... I'm very sincere. If you want to be there November 3rd, 
you're in, man. Totally in. I will, I will check my schedule. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, buddy. Sounds Appreciate like it. a lot of fun. Yay. Well, Ed, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, on the show and updating us on all those various topics. Um, we got. I want to do a field trip to your office, too. This is, this is really cool. It's open for you. Just let me know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ed. Thanks. Thanks, Paul and the whole crew there. Thank you so much. Bye.